Hello, everyone. Good afternoon um, and good morning for some of you. Uh, my name is Adina vogel Ilone, and I am J Street's Chief of Staff. Uh, I will be moderating today's J Stream about the unfolding crisis in Israel and the occupied territory and how our movement is, uh, is responding. Uh, and I am pleased to be joined by J Street's President, Jeremy ben -Ami. Um, who has just returned from leading our latest Len Hill Education Program Congressional Delegation and Leadership Mission to the region, uh, a trip that included 15 members of Congress, which was our largest delegation to date. Uh, and I, I want to make sure that I have time to address all of the questions that might come through this webinar. So I will begin the discussion with, um, with my own questions, with a moderated Q&A, um, and then I will open it up to, to the questions from the viewers. So please do feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box um, throughout the conversation. And um, also, it's a pleasure, Jeremy, to be talking through the wall to you. Um, <laughs> we, we are all of 20 feet from each other right now. Uh, so yeah, this is very nice uh, speaking to you through the screen. Um, but all right, let's 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 get started, Jeremy. Let's dive in because there's a lot to cover. Uh, so before we talk about the most recent developments on the ground, um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the situation on the ground during the congressional delegation um, just last week. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your itinerary? Who did the members of Congress meet with? Uh, what types of perspectives did they hear uh, on the trip? Sure, and it's simply an amazing and historic moment for the state of Israel. And to be arriving on a Saturday night, uh, our first opening dinner was literally uh, down the block from the demonstrations. Uh, we brought the members of Congress from the airport and they were able to witness firsthand the uh, incredible uh, turnout on the Saturday night uh, demonstration. Uh, we spend the early parts of our trip uh, in sort of a 101 mode, as I describe it, you know, just helping people to know the basics about the conflict and to understand a little bit of the history. We meet with uh, Polster. We're all very familiar with Dahlia Scheinlin. We get uh, Palestinian uh, professor to give a history of the Palestinian national movement. I do some history of the state of Israel and of Zionism. A uh, great visit to the Paris Center with Nadav uh, Tamir to understand a little bit about uh, uh, some of the positive, really wonderful things that have been accomplished over the course of 75 years by the state of Israel. Um, so that's how you begin the trip. But then we go to uh, uh, Jerusalem on the, on the next day, and we are in the Knesset, uh, literally as the Knesset is debating and voting on the very first reading of some of the legislation that's part of this judicial coup or judicial reform, depending on who you're speaking to. Uh, and it was uh, fascinating, of course, for the members of Congress to be in the Israeli parliament building uh, on the day that this epic uh, historic debate is taking place. And we were able to meet with leaders of uh, some of the opposition parties at that particular moment. We were uh, able to, to sit with Yair Lapid and Merav Mikhaeli and Mansour Abbas and get their positions and their thoughts on, on what's going on. Um, I will say that Mirav Mikhaeli really made uh, the point to the members that I think is so critical uh, that the judicial reform has to be understood not uh, simply as some people try to slough it off as uh, the prime minister looking for a way out of his criminal liability and the, and the trial that he's under and, and bringing down the whole judicial system out of personal interest. It has to be understood as part of a larger ideological challenge uh, to the direction of the state of Israel. Uh, the reason why the extreme right in Israel has the agenda of undoing the courts and, and the protections that the courts provides to minorities is because the court has been the number one obstacle in the way of the far right's agenda, uh, which is to control the entirety of the land. Uh, and uh, you know, the new coalition government, the very first point of agreement of all the parties is to extend uh, and, and have Jewish sovereignty over all of the land. And the Supreme Court of Israel has been one of the main obstacles uh, to achieving that. So we heard, I think, a very clear message from Mirach Mikhaeli, and it's been a message that I think perhaps has not been as clear as it could be at some of the rallies and, uh, you know, some of the opposition uh, uh, that is out there uh, is focused on uh, separation of powers, rule of law, uh, the health of democracy, but the tie between 
uh, occupation and then the uh, uh, agenda related to annexation and control uh, and what the court does to block that. I think that tie is so important for everybody to understand. So we really got a good glimpse of that. And then, um, you know, the question of what's happening on uh, the West Bank, what's happening in the occupied territory. Uh, we were also there on the day of the uh, deadly raid into Nablus, in which 11 people died and more than 100 were injured, and it was an IDF operation. Um, and, you know, there's so much daily violence and so much back and forth. Uh, there was a, uh, a killing the next day uh, in Huara that led to then the deadly pogrom that took place over the weekend. But all of this was happening as we were there. Uh, and part of our agenda on these trips is to spend half your time inside Israel and half your time over the Green Line uh, in Palestinian territory and, and getting to know that side of the story and the people. Um, and we were forced to have to change some of our agenda because of the uh, security situation. Uh, we didn't go up to Ramallah as we normally do. We did get to see uh, Hebron, uh, and we went with uh, Breaking the Silence and uh, saw that firsthand. And we saw some of the people uh, in the villages in the South Hebron Hills, which I think is an exceedingly important thing for people to see firsthand, uh, get a sense of the realities and put individual stories and pictures uh, to the issues that they deal with. And, and so we did get in the midst of tremendous upheaval on the West Bank, uh, we did get to do those things as well. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I remember um, watching the news and uh, just following, knowing where you were in the itinerary and just understanding at that time um, of the reports from Nablus, just understanding the impact that that has um, on the trip. And I think that is uh, one of the unique, well, this one in particular was most unique. You were really there at the the height of um, of a lot of the tension and escalation. And the point that you made, which we will come back to, because I do want to take some time to really dive into the connection and the ideological connection. And it's so important that Merav Michaeli made that distinction. And we are seeing not enough people are making that distinction. And this point of tension of whether or not to draw that line, um, as you noted, exists there within the protest moves and also exists here um, in the United States. And uh, I, I definitely think that we have a role uh, and we will talk about that a little further on in making that connection. So after this very packed itinerary, and of course, you know, the continuous developments on the ground, uh, what do you feel were the main takeaways um, that the members had from this trip? Well, I, I do think that the number one takeaway that people come away from always, and even more so this time, uh, is just how urgent it is to have outside leadership and engagement. Uh, the United States, I think, you know, and, and we've talked about this as J Street, um, we've said that this administration uh, has not engaged as proactively and deeply as we would like uh, in efforts to try to uh, uh, move the, the conflict in the right direction. I, I hesitate to even say resolve the conflict anymore, but, you know, it, it is deteriorating so rapidly uh, and, and outside help is needed to stop that deterioration. And I think that the number one takeaway for anybody who goes there to visit right now and really takes a look at what's, what's happening, particularly as the security situation is devolving on the West Bank, um, understands you've got to have outside engagement. And so on the Sunday after we left, uh, the United States did pull together a security summit in Aqaba, Jordan, that brought together Jordan, Egypt, uh, the U.S., Israel, and the Palestinian Authority. And that's the first time that those countries have met in an official capacity, uh, probably in a decade, uh, since uh, around the time of the collapse of the, the Kerry uh, initiative back in the Obama administration. And so there, there is some effort on the part of the Biden administration to do this. And I think that's the number one uh, takeaway. I think that the stakes of the moment uh, and just how uh, critical this is to what kind of a country uh, Israel intends to be as it, as it hits 75, which is a very significant milestone. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a point in a country's history when real decisions have to be made about the nature and some of the fundamental problems that just haven't been resolved, just come to the forefront and need to be resolved. I think the members walked away understanding what a, a pivotal and critical uh, hinge point in Israel's history 
this is. Uh, and the United States has a role to play. And we have uh, facilitated uh, through our uh, aid and through sort of unquestioned support of the state of Israel for whatever it is that it does, uh, we own part of the problem. Uh, you know, we as the United States, as policymakers, as, as folks who are setting the agenda in Washington, I think they understand that part of the responsibility for what's happening here uh, does rest on the shoulders of the United States for the way that it has engaged up to this point in the conflict. Yeah, and of course, we know, you know, it is the U.S. Israel relationship is so important to us. And of course, the shared values between the countries are important to us and being able to, you know, weigh in when those shared values, of course, are in jeopardy. I'm wondering if you think now we have about a quarter of the Democratic caucus in the House that has participated in our Len Hill education program. Um, and, you know, just talk based on that takeaway about the importance of U.S. leadership and U.S. involvement and understanding, um, you know, what a constructive U.S.-Israel relationship um, should look like. Uh, how do you think we can really leverage their experiences on, um, on our trips to increase further engagement um, on the issues that are so important to us? Well, I think one of the major things that I see among the folks who have gone, we've taken over 80 members of Congress uh, on these trips now over the course of the last uh, eight or nine years. And um, as you said, in the sitting Congress today, uh, there are well over a quarter of the members have been on, on our trips. And when they are presented by uh, advocacy groups and, and constituents uh, with issues uh, let's say, what is the status of Jerusalem, right? And they're presented with these issues in a uh, very abstract and theoretical way. And they're told by certain constituencies that, for instance, Israel is the eternal unified capital of the Jewish people. And that talking point is a, you know, longstanding one within Israel advocacy. They will have visited Jerusalem uh, and driven the streets. And they will understand that Israel, that the Jerusalem is the capital of two peoples, uh, you know, and that there is a very vibrant Arab and Palestinian city uh, that is also Jerusalem. And understanding that allows you to craft better policy. It allows you to uh, provide the space eventually, I hope, one day uh, to a president uh, to make a statement that, in fact, there should be a capital for a Palestinian state in the eastern part of Jerusalem, which is a Palestinian city and, and is a city to which the Palestinian community has centuries old ties. Uh, and, and seeing that firsthand and understanding that and meeting the residents, um, it creates the space for better policy. Uh, and to the extent that it is understood what a settlement is, you know, what is a firing zone? What is an outpost? What do these things mean? When you see the reality on the ground of how the families live in Susia, and you see the water pipe uh, that has been laid that runs through their land that serves the settlement of Susia and not the village of Susia, uh, it changes forever uh, the way that you're going to approach these issues. And I think that's why there is pressure uh, from other parts of the pro-Israel community to not go on a trip like this so that you won't see these things. And I think it is amazing to me on every trip that we take at the closing dinner, uh, when the members uh, talk about uh, what they have gathered and what they've gained, uh, it is an eye-opening and in some cases a life-changing experience for some of the members who've been engaged in these issues for decades. Uh, and I also think it's so important to note that um, by not actually engaging in these in these issues and seeing these things firsthand, it actually does a disservice um, to to the U.S. Israel relationship and to the you know broader pro Israel community. Um, all right, you. I want to transition into a little bit of a review, a recap of some of the most concerning developments over the past week. You did touch on some of them already, um, but there have been things that have been happening that have been quite unprecedented. Um, you know, both in terms of, of violence that we've been seeing on the West Bank, also in terms of policy actions, statements made at in Aqaba, as you referenced, and then statements made that contradict those statements in in Aqaba. Can you? walk us through just a little bit of what's happened. I think it's basically now the past four days. Um, and uh, and then I would I would love to ask you some follow-up questions as to the connection between the two. 
Right. Well, the, the starting point, I think, in terms of the West Bank, let's let's put the democracy legislation and, and all of the judicial issues to the side for a second. On the West Bank, I think the important thing for people to understand is just how much the security situation is unraveling in real time. Um, Bill Burns, who's the CIA director, was in Israel in the West Bank about two and a half weeks ago, maybe approaching three weeks ago now. And he was very engaged uh, in this region around the time of the outbreak of the Second Intifada. And he made a very clear public uh, statement that in his view and based on his experience that all of the conditions are there for the kind of explosion on the West Bank that, that happened 20 years ago. Uh, there is a lack of security control by the Palestinian Authority at this point in major residential uh, centers such as uh, Janine and Nablus. Uh, the PA security forces simply do not have control in those cities. There are places like Jericho, uh, which have never really been the scenes of uh, violence uh, and, and, and host to violence. And that's the city which it appears from which uh, for instance, the most re recent killing of this, uh, it sounds like a, just a wonderful 27-year-old Columbia student who was a dual citizen and, uh, you know, was killed on the road near near Jericho. And we never saw that before. And so the the collapse of, of security um, and, and then the uh, open incitement by leading Israeli figures uh, uh, to violence uh, by settlers uh, is again something you, you've just not seen coming from official Israel before, uh, and so these conditions, the 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 kindling is a fire, and people are standing there with matches ready to light uh, all of this up, and it really is, uh, I think, uh, you know, close to unprecedented just how fraught that is, and that was why the security summit was brought together on Sunday. It's precisely because everybody, uh, you know, from King Abdullah to President Sisi to Secretary of State Blinken, everybody understands that this is a highly combustible situation. Uh, and a communique was signed and issued uh, by all the participants in the summit committing to certain things. And it's simply outrageous. I would think it would be outrageous to the US government that the National Security Advisor of the State of Israel is signing the agreement uh, in Aqaba and the national security minister, Itamar Ben-Gavir, and the now minister within the defense ministry, Betzal el Smotrich, in real time are saying they know nothing of this superfluous summit uh, that's taking place in Aqaba. And, uh, you know, what happens in Jordan stays in Jordan. And so, um, you know, this, this question of who is driving the bus, you know, of the Israeli government, who's in charge, and and the prime minister keeps reassuring uh, all the delegations that meet, uh, and, and our delegation did meet with the prime minister, and, and he met with senators from both parties, and he's met with Secretary of State Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and he keeps saying, my hands are firmly on the steering wheel, and, and my concern, and I wrote this in, in a piece we put out just the other day, my concern is that he's sitting in the model in the showroom while the real car is being driven off a cliff by Ben Gvir and Smotrich, right? That he has his hands on a steering wheel that's completely ineffective because it's disconnected from the actual car that's driving the, the state of Israel right now. And uh, um, this is, you know, a, a real problem. Um, and uh, I think, you know, you see uh, the concern from the regional neighbors, you see the concern here in the United States, and certainly, of course, uh, the Europeans as well have joined in, in, in joint statements as well. Yeah, and I, you know, you mentioned incitement, um, you know, and just today, of course, we we saw the the statements coming from uh, Bezalel Smotrich uh, about uh, wiping out um, Hawara, which he then tried to walk back. Um, but I think it is very important to understand that those statements, including prior rhetoric, have really given you know the wind beneath the sails of those that are perpetuating. Um, very violent attacks uh, against Palestinians uh, in the West Bank. And Hawara was unprecedented in, in its scope and size um, and has been called a pogrom. Uh, but that does not mean that, of course, that these attacks are not happening on a very regular basis um, throughout the West Bank. Uh, and there's even, I think, a State Department report that was just released specifically on 2021 uh, documenting um, right. this type of violence. 
And it's very clear, as you mentioned, what are the sources of those that are giving um, support and backing to the individuals that are taking, you know, rule of law into their own hands. Um, so just, you know, going back to the Biden administration, and you noted, you know, specifically that they are, are very focused on trying to prevent further escalation, and we have commended them on, you know, their recent attempts to do so. Um, you've also alluded to the fact that you don't feel that it has been um, and has been enough. Uh, what do you think the, the Biden administration should be doing um, and saying at this time? So another thing, I mean, this has just been so much happening over the course of these last two to three weeks. Uh, another thing that happened in the midst of all of this was a UN Security Council meeting. There's a standing monthly meeting. Um, the UAE is the president of the Security Council at the moment. There was going to be a resolution uh, that uh, specifically would condemn uh, the announcements by uh, the government of Israel about new settlements and the legalization of illegal outposts, and there were a handful of other uh, steps that were part of a package that were announced by the, the government of Israel, and that led to talk of a Security Council resolution, and, um, you know, the, the, the administration worked very, very intensively uh, with members of the Security Council to avoid there being a resolution, um, and to avoid what they perceived as then the pressure they would be under to veto a resolution. So instead, out came a statement of the president of the Security Council that all 15 members of the Security Council, including the United States, signed on to, but it didn't include a quote-unquote condemnation of what had happened, and there's no consequences. And I think, you know, J Street has, for a dozen years now, uh, been very clear that uh, one of the things the United States needs to do is to stop providing a diplomatic immunity, essentially, uh, to the policies of the government of Israel that violate international law. Uh, you know, it is very clear that for decades, the international community, and it used to be the case that the United States viewed what is happening on this territory that was won in a legitimate war uh, in 1967, that what's happening there is illegal under international law, whether it's the settlements or the treatment of the uh, population that lives there, uh, these this is not living up to the obligations of the Geneva Conventions. And so that is something that uh, the United States really needs to reconsider uh, its policy. And this administration, um, you know, in J Street's opinion and in many other uh, commentators' opinions, uh, including former ambassadors to the state of Israel from Dan Kurtzer, Martin Indyk, and others, uh, you know, the United States needs to no longer provide automatic veto protection uh, for the state of Israel at the UN Security Council. That's one thing. Um, the second thing that I think the, the Biden administration has not done, uh, it hasn't rolled back some of the key policies that were put into place by the prior administration, uh, which undercut uh, America's position about the ultimate disposition of this territory. Uh, the notion that there is a legal distinction between the territory that Israel occupied and the state of Israel is really important in our own law. Uh, and, and the president and this administration should re-articulate fundamental American positions. It's not enough to give lip service to just say, you know, we support a two-state solution and equal measures of uh, this and that for both peoples. There needs to be some clear articulation about American policy and that the territory over the green line is occupied territory. It is not part of the state of Israel. It should not be considered under the same uh, law. Uh, and, and that is one of the things this Israeli government is moving towards, is trying to uh, essentially de facto annex the territory by applying civilian law to Israeli settlers and settlements that are in the occupied territory. So there are steps that this administration needs to take to hold the government of Israel accountable and this is from a place of friendship, right? I want to be really, really clear. When J Street says these things, we, we say these things because we care deeply about the state of Israel. And we care about the people of Israel. We want the state of Israel to be a democracy that is secure and that has a Jewish nature and a Jewish character. And the only way it can do that is if the Palestinian people have a state in which they have their own national self-determination living next door to, to Israel. And that's got to be reaffirmed as the core basis of American policy. And then certain steps have to be taken to ensure that that possibility isn't being foreclosed by this government of Israel, whose very core policy raison d'etre is to make sure that there never is a Palestinian state. 
And we need to call that out and we need to oppose it and we need to give some meaningful consequences, uh, such as accountability in international institutions for pursuing a policy that forecloses that option. Um, and, you know, of course, you just really very clearly drew, you know, the linkage between, you know, what is happening with the judicial overhaul, I will call it that, the overhaul. All right, we'll agree um, on that. We'll, we'll yes. compromise on overhaul instead of coup. Um, in, uh, and the impacts that it's having, you know, in Green Line Israel, uh, and of course, the policies that are being promoted um, by, uh, by the ideological right over the Green Line. Um, one, I would love for you to just go back. You did mention it, just like really tying tying the two threads together and address how we can really encourage more people here um, to talk about um, and see the linkage between undermining Israeli democracy um, and promoting these policies of, of annexation that you outlined. Right. And as we said, you know, it, it is really important to recognize that in parallel to all of this that we are discussing that is happening in the security situation and on the West Bank, there is this immense crisis of Israeli democracy. Right. And this set of proposals that it's it's too long a laundry list to even begin to enumerate all the different pieces of legislation, some of which are moving as government proposals, some of which are moving as private bills, some of which are at first reading, some of which have moved beyond that in the Knesset. I mean, there's just a lot going on. And this seminar isn't, you know, long enough to give everybody the full background. But the essence of it uh, is to take away what is the only uh, check and balance in the Israeli system. There is no constitution in Israel, uh, and the Supreme Court is really the only check on the power of a parliamentary uh, government that has a combination legislator, legislative and executive branch. The way we have in our system three branches of government, essentially there's really only two uh, branches in Israel because the legislator, legislature and the executive are so closely tied. And the Supreme Court has been the bulwark protecting minority rights. It has been protecting the rule of law. Uh, and the government is looking through its proposals to essentially give the legislature and the government uh, not only a veto over court decisions, but also unfettered ability to appoint the judges in the first place. And so it really, it eviscerates any notion of separations of, of power, uh, the rule of law, uh, people talk about it as the urbanization uh, of Israel and, and moving. It's the first thing that happens in these the democracies that take their steps down the road towards illiberal democracy um, is, is the undercutting of the court because the court protects the rights of minorities uh, and majority rule does not make a democracy. A democracy is made when you have majority rule and protection for the minority within the context of, of majority rule. And so the that that is all happening at the same time, and that is what is leading to tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds now of thousands of people in the streets of Israel is the concern about what's happening to our democracy and the protections that are provided, whether it is to uh, you know the uh, Palestinians on the West Bank, which is not the central concern of the people in the streets of of Tel Aviv, but it could be uh, you know the status of women, the status of the LGBT community, the status of the minority of Arab citizens within Israel. It's it's all of these communities and, and the rights are at risk uh, because of the proposals that this government's put out there. But you have to ask yourself, why? Why is it that the extreme right in Israel has the Supreme Court in its sights? Why, why are they doing this? And uh, you cannot answer that question without understanding the fundamental ideological purpose on the far right, which is to control all the land from the river to the sea uh, and, and to put it under the sovereignty of the Jewish state. Uh, and it is a continuation of the Jewish, of the nation state law uh, in 2018. And this idea that uh, there will be one state and that one state uh, is going to have a Jewish nature uh, and that is going to overrule the democracy. So I think it's, it's, it's absolutely vital uh, that as all of us who are engaged in opposing uh, these judicial reforms are holding rallies and giving speeches and briefing our synagogues and briefing our communities on what's happening, that the connection be made to what is happening on the West Bank and, and to the agenda of annexation, 
de facto, de jure, but you know, it is not a uh, you know an urban legend. This is not conspiracy theories. This is the first line of the coalition agreement. Uh, you know that there is a right to exclusive Jewish rule between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, and it's right there in black and white in the coalition agreement. And so I think it's really important to tie these together. Uh, J Street certainly will do that at every chance that it can. But you know we see for tactical reasons that that there are people organizing rallies and you know doing the work in Israel and here who say let's not bring you know the occupation into this let's not raise the Palestinian issue but you can't understand why this is all happening uh, and it's a moment of education I think too for the American public and the American Jewish community about how all this is tied together. Thanks. Yeah, I've I'm seeing a few questions coming through the Q and A that have been specifically asking about why people aren't dry, drawing that connection, both in Israel and within the American Jewish community. Um, and of course, what our role really is uh, in, in making that connection. I do think that you address that, so I don't want to go back to it. And I, I think that point of education is really, is really key, um, is being able to have a conversation which uh, which really does point to to the the connectivity uh, between the agenda of the of the settler right, uh, and of course, you know, you addressed that their impact in sort of steering uh, Netanyahu's car in a certain direction uh, and making it very clear that that connection um, exists and is really the threat to this liberal democracy, the state of Israel that we care so um, so deeply about. Uh, okay, there's also a few questions here, just going back um, to, to the security situation, um, specifically on the West Bank. Uh, what do you think uh, the role of, uh, of the IDF, uh, the Ministry of Defense, should be uh, in, in addressing the situation on the West Bank? And, and uh, if you would like to also add in, um, what do you think, what, what have you seen so far? What have you been hearing, perhaps, when you met with the IDF also um, in the most recent delegation? Well, you know, one would hope that the leadership of the IDF would remain 100% uh, committed to the obligations of an occupying army uh, in the territory that it is controlling, uh, which is to take care of the people who were living there when you took control. That's the fundamental obligation under international law. Um, and so when settlers threaten Palestinian olive trees, people, villages, property, uh, the, the notion that the IDF uh, should be protecting the people and the property who were there before the IDF was there, uh, that is their obligation. And, and when you speak to some parts of the IDF command structure and some parts of Israel's government, there is acknowledgement of that, but I think that the reality is that the army has not, the IDF has not fulfilled that responsibility. And I think that's a real issue that the United States should be raising. I know that uh, uh, the defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, is headed uh, to Israel next week uh, and will be meeting with Yoav Gallant. And I think, you know, we provide $3.8 billion a year uh, in security assistance to the state of Israel. And I think that it is a perfectly legitimate uh, point for the United States to be insisting uh, that the IDF uh, take a stronger role uh, is with regards to settler violence. What we hear when we visit, and we ask this question on the ground, uh, we hear from some elements of Israeli security services and from the government that Palestinians should turn to the police uh, for help. Right, and that these are civil matters, and and if you have a problem with an Israeli citizen who is doing something, then you should call the police. Uh, and and to tell a Palestinian villager to go to the nearest settlement, knock on the gate, and ask to please come in and go to the police station to file a complaint against a settler, I think is not you know a a realistic. Your feet are not firmly planted on the ground if that's the way that you are approaching things. And I think it's really an important again piece for the United States, given that we are providing so much assistance to ensure Israel's security, to ask that that assistance be used in compliance with international law is not out of line. Um, and 
Also summarizing some of the questions that I've been seeing in the chat, um, you know, specifically taking it back to the action um, of what members of Congress can do. Um, and you know, you mentioned some of the things that were um, meaningful to them and some of the things that you would like to see coming out of the administration. What's the role of Congress? What kind of action can we see? Um, and what kind of actions do we hope that our trips inspire members of Congress to take? Well, the, the way that I always describe it in, in some of the Folks who are on this briefing have probably heard me say this now for 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, the, the Congress creates the political atmosphere within which American foreign policy is set. Uh, the president of the United States and, and the State Department, Defense Department, et cetera, they have the majority, overwhelming majority of the toolkit for making American foreign policy. But the constraints on what the president and the secretary of state and other diplomats feel they can do are almost always political, uh, you know, and they are almost always, well, if we do such and such, then we will never hear the end of it from Congress, right? And we will get so much pressure from Capitol Hill over doing X or Y or Z. So the single most important thing that members of Congress can do is to put wind in the sails of the administration uh, to show support for American action and leadership and for uh, bolder steps by the Biden administration uh, to engage here at this really critical moment. If you are a friend of the state of Israel, Congress should be saying to the president, and in fact, there is a letter circulating right now in Congress from uh, representatives uh, DeLauro, Schakowsky, and McGovern. I would note that those three members, very senior Democrats in the House, were the three leaders of three of our most recent congressional delegations out of the four uh, you know, that we've done since COVID, uh, three of them are Rosa DeLauro, Jan Schakowsky, and Jim McGovern were the senior members of their delegations. And this letter is urging the administration to act, uh, you know, and to take bolder stands and to be more forceful. And I think that's the number one thing, to, to make it clear that Congress and the allies of the president in Congress are not urging him to do less, they're urging him to do more. And that is the fundamental role that they can play is to create a better atmosphere for American policymaking. There is the power of the purse. Uh, Congress is uh, in charge of money uh, and spending. And the question of what is the oversight that we give to the aid that we provide, the questions of how is our aid being used? Uh, you know, if a Palestinian village is being uh, demolished or there are evictions taking place, are soldiers being equipped with the arms that we've bought? Right, that is not okay. This is not advancing American policy, and so Congress can do much more uh, to oversee and provide accountability and and oversight and uh, uh, you know ask the you know right questions about how our aid is being used. So those are some of the things we can do. I think it's very it's wonderful when Congress provides a spotlight on a particular village or a particular uh, settlement expansion project that would be devastating if it advanced. And that international spotlight, Congress, the EU, UN, others, it means that the Israeli government often stops doing some of the worst of the things that it might be considering doing uh, because of the spotlight. And so those are some of the things that Congress can do. Thanks. And you mentioned aid and accountability, and I'm going to shift to another series of questions or a common thread that I'm seeing in the Q&A, um, which is, uh, the role of the American Jewish community and the, the funding and support that's coming from the American Jewish community. How much influence do you see, one, in terms of the American Jewish community's role in what is happening in policymaking in Israel, um, and two, influencing um, what's happening here in terms of policymaking coming out of the United States? So I think it's really important for the folks listening to this to understand that when this new government in Israel came into office and the justice minister walked into his office on day one and appointed a director general to his ministry, that that director general came out of an Israeli NGO that had an entire legislative agenda already drafted, all the work done to write the bills that would undercut Israeli democracy. What is that Israeli NGO? That Israeli NGO is called the Kohelet Policy Forum. 
where does the money come from for the Kohelet Policy Forum? It's American 501c3 tax preferenced dollars, right? And the American Jewish community is funding the very institute that wrote the legislation that's going to undercut Israeli democracy. And the donors got a tax break for making the contribution. So we own responsibility for some of what's going on over there. And I think it's really important to understand how much of the uh, right-wing agenda in Israel is funded by American uh, donors. And I think sometimes there isn't even awareness that people think they're giving to causes that are good for Israel and good for you know the democratic uh, debate, et cetera. And they don't even know sometimes exactly what it is that they are putting their money towards. So that's one piece of this is that there's a a charitable flow of money that has built out not only the Kohelet Policy Forum, but you know groups like Regavim, which was founded by Betzel El Smotrich, who's now the minister in charge of the occupation, and it was you know founded in order to uh, set up the mechanisms that would allow for Palestinians ultimately to be driven out of the land. And that was the goal of, of Regavim, and now he's in charge of the land. Uh, and you know these are all organizations that get the predominance of their money from the United States, from donors here in the United States. Um, the other thing that I think is you know got to be called out explicitly is that part of the reason that policymakers in this country don't do some of the things that we'd like to see them to do is because of the pressure uh, that they get from American lobbies and and from other organizations that basically say don't comment, don't do anything, don't speak out. Um, don't criticize. If you do criticize, uh, you know, it, it it's amounts to close to anti-Semitism. Uh, this is unhelpful. We, we need friendly uh, voices and, and, and Israelis who we care about and respect, former prime ministers, former heads of the IDF, people who are on the right ideologically, from Danny Gordas to Yossi Klein Alevi and Mati Friedman, they are calling on American Jews to speak out loudly and clearly and so a lobbying agenda that says you can't criticize and you shouldn't use your bully pulpit uh, to weigh in on these things, uh, at this point, that is not the agenda of the pro-democracy, pro-Israel uh, you know, uh, community in Israel. Uh, they are asking for American Jews uh, to speak out and to weigh in and to make clear what the cost to Israel and to the U.S.-Israel relationship and to world Jewry will be if this extreme government moves forward with its extreme agenda. And the most pro-Israel thing that anyone can do is to speak out on these issues and to encourage our policymakers and our communal leaders to make their voices even louder and even more heard. Amen. Um, I'm going to I'm going to throw another question at you that you've heard uh, that you I think that has been posed to you a lot, but it is a common thread, another common thread throughout the the, the several questions that we're receiving in the Q&A, um, which is about the viability of the two state solution and the future of the two state solution. And how do we see our role as J Street um, in that discussion um, about the viability of the two state solution? So look, uh, you know, I've given speeches about this, written about this, uh, you know, there's more than enough material that people can really dig into online with my in-depth thoughts on all of this. But the, the bottom line is that we're, we're nowhere near a two-state resolution on February or March 1 of 2023. And that's not really the relevant conversation at the moment. If one tries to think about how does Israel remain a Jewish nation that is the national homeland of the Jewish people and retain its Jewish character and remain a democracy, I cannot come up with a way to do that unless there is a Palestinian state alongside it. Uh, you know, when one looks out in the distance and says, where does this all go? If you want Israel to be a kind of state that you can relate to, the kind of state that you grew up believing in, the kind of state that we all want it to be, there's no way for it to do that without there being a state of Palestine that is next to it. Uh, and so that's, you know, what one has to keep out there as, as a goal. But in, in March of 2023, that question isn't the relevant question. The question is, how do we, if, if we're in a deep, deep hole and we want to get out of the hole, what's the first rule of holes? You stop digging. And, and we have to get the policies of the United States to say to the state of Israel and to the Palestinians, and I want to make this also very clear, there, 
it is not that the Palestinians have no responsibility in all of this. This is not all on the state of Israel. Both of these sides need to take steps that move in the right direction. The Palestinians and our delegation made this very clear to the Palestinians' uh, leadership that we spoke to. Uh, the Palestinians have to reform their prisoner payment program, right? They have to address uh, issues of incitement. Their security forces have to be strengthened and reformed and take back control of the cities that they're responsible for. These are on the Palestinian shoulders as well. But American policy right now has to be to get the two sides to stop digging deeper into the hole that they're in. And we need to stop steps that amount to annexation. We need to stop the crumbling of Israeli democracy. We need to stop the crumbling of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we, we can see a path where the normalization of the state of Israel's relations with its Arab neighbors uh, is a potential engine to help bring about steps that move in the right direction. There's an incentive that the state of Israel has to do things that allow Oman and Kuwait and ultimately Saudi Arabia to begin to normalize relations. And part of that has to be, how do you begin to take steps that are positive for Palestinians and and let's let's harness that to move in the right direction. So I'm not saying that the two state solution uh, you know is imminent and we're not going to call a diplomatic conference to discuss it tomorrow, but it remains the, the the idea of two independent nation states, one the national home of the Jewish people, one the national home of the Palestinian people. It remains the only viable way out of this conflict. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, and one very important question to all of our viewers, um, there's over 400 of you now on this Zoom, uh, and I hope that many more of you will be watching uh, this recording. Uh, what do you see as the role of all of us, all of us, all of our viewers, you know, our movement throughout the United States? What can we as individuals be doing? Well, I think, you know, we, we first of all, are constituents of our elected officials, right? And so J Streets as an organization, our little piece of a very big puzzle uh, is what are the messages coming from our community, people who care very deeply about Israel and who care about our Jewish community, who care about our Palestinian friends and neighbors, uh, you know, what are the messages we are conveying to our elected officials. And the number one thing that we can all do is to make sure that we are constantly in touch with those elected officials, that we are organizing our efforts to, to make sure they understand that the majority, overwhelming majority of Jewish America is deeply, deeply concerned about what is happening right now, and that we want to see American policy that is leaning in, not pulling back. Uh, and, and as constituents who are helping to shape American policy. That's our number one goal. Number number two, there's lots and lots of incredible Israeli organizations and incredible Israelis who are in the streets and who are in the courts and who are in the, the political process who are fighting for the future of their country. Uh, and we can support them. Uh, you know, and for some that's going to be financially. I mean, I of course highlight our close partners like uh uh, you know, the New Israel Fund and, and Americans for Peace Now, both of which are supporting elements of Israeli society, but there's so much more out there. There are so many ways to be supportive of the organizations, the Movement for Quality Government, uh, Israel Chofshit. Uh, you know, there's a whole series of, of organizations that are out there that are very much engaged in ensuring the future of Israel's vibrant democracy. Um, and so that's a second thing that we can do. We, we can support and, and make our voice heard in our own system. And then we can support the Israelis who share our values. This fight for democracy, we know it all too well uh, here in the United States, right? We are experiencing it ourselves. We have an extreme right-wing ethno-nationalist populist movement that threatens our own democracy. And so we understand very well the forces that are threatening Israeli democracy. And we can support our partners, the people having the exact same fight over there about their country are the people we should be supporting. And so those are two things. I would say one final thing, which is push our synagogues and our community centers to open up 
to have a vibrant conversation about all these issues. I just cannot stand how much I hear over and over again, my synagogue doesn't want to touch the Israel issue, right? We can't have an open conversation about these issues. We've got to. It's so un-Jewish and it is so unhealthy to shut down debate and, and argument. And, and let's have that discussion. Let, let's actually discuss these issues and understand how important it is for American Jewish identity here at home, what happens over there. If the state of Israel goes down the Orban path and, and, and is in a state of permanent occupation and annexation de facto or de jure, and millions of people are being held by a state of the Jewish people without their political rights, this does not bode well for the Jewish community in this country and our own health and the values we teach our kids and our grandkids. And so we've got to have an open conversation about that. So lobbying and engagement and support uh, in the policy making and political process in this country, supporting our partners who are working for these values and goals over there, and ensuring that our communal institutions are opening up the doors to this debate and to this discussion rather than closing the doors. And I think very importantly on the last point um, about the communal discourse, and and you know this touches on also some of the questions here in terms of there has been a variety of different American Jewish organizations that have been speaking out, notably about the judicial reform or overhaul, um, and and been vocal in a way that has pretend has been unprecedented for some of these organizations. Uh, but I think what is so crucial in noting that is the distinction that you made about making the connection between what is happening and the impacts inside the green line to the impacts over the green line. And part of our responsibility is making sure that when we are having these conversations, that that type of connection is being made um, with this space that has been opened up by American Jewish organizations organizations, um, all of us that care deeply about the future um, of Israel. Uh, and, you know, also noting here a question about, you know, what do we do, right, all of us in the pro-Israel community, if these judicial bills pass? Um, where I, I want to kind of perhaps close on that note. What, what is our role? Um, and you did mention our support for our allies in Israel, but what is our role in the pro-Israel community that care also so deeply about democracy and peace um, if we see this overhaul go through? Right, well, I think one of the things that that people keep saying is, you know, they're sort of throwing up their hands and, and quote unquote, giving up on Israel. Um, Israel's gonna continue to exist. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's going to be out there in whatever form it chooses because the people of Israel will choose their leaders, the leaders will set the laws, and then you know the country will run itself the way that it chooses to run itself. And millions and millions and millions of Jewish Americans and others who care about Israel will continue to live in this country. And there will continue to be a need to have some form of relationship. Uh, you know, and it may be uh, that that is uh, you know, a place that we cannot relate to, but we're gonna have to explain it to ourselves, right? We're gonna have to come to grips with it if American, Jewish communities are going to thrive and survive and move forward, we're going to have to have an open discussion about how the things that are happening over there are inconsistent with the values on which we raise our children and our grandchildren, right? The, the, the ideas of what it means uh, to, to have power and treat minorities with respect and with equal rights, that's what we fight for in this country because we're a minority, Right. And if we're going to be true to that, we're going to continue to advocate and argue with a, a state of Israel that goes down an Orban, uh, Hungary, Poland kind of path. And, and we will continue to say we, we love uh, the state of Israel. We love the people who live there. Uh, and we adamantly disagree with the course that they choose to go down if that's the road they choose to go down. And I think that unfortunately, uh, you know, a fair number of Israelis who live there now uh, will agree with us on that. Uh, and, you know, we'll see whether or not the pressure of the exodus of capital, the exodus of high tech, the, uh, you know, other uh, forms of movement that I think would happen if Israel goes down that road, maybe that will be enough uh, to begin to pressure uh, the government to reverse course. Yeah, and we are seeing some, you know, statements even today from from former IDF chiefs of staff saying that, you know, should this judicial overhaul go through that that they would not he would not come to serve in reserve duty and we're seeing also statements of many others, right? You know, these are people that are patriots that care about their country, the future of their country. They're saying they won't be, be able to stand up. Um 
in uh, reserve duty, which is very significant um, moment. What about the high tech, you know, the high tech uh, industry, right? Yeah. You know, I just I saw yet another piece uh, today, over and over and over again. High tech CEOs, the startup nation, the core of what everybody's so excited and proud of of what Israel has managed to become out of nothing in in seventy five years. They are pulling their businesses out. They won't stay. Uh, the credit rating will plummet. The venture capital firms will leave. The, the high tech leadership is saying we will not start our next business in Israel if this is where it goes. And I'm I'm hopeful that this kind of movement in support of the core values of a democracy, the core values of a state of the Jewish people, will be enough to turn the tide. Uh, and I will never give up. Uh, J Street will never give up. Uh, you know we will continue to have a vibrant Jewish community in the United States, and there will continue to be a state that is the homeland of the Jewish people uh, in the land of Israel. And these two communities are going to have to wrestle and grapple with that relationship over the coming decades. And our kids and our grandkids will continue to wrestle with that relationship. Uh, and what's important is that we do it from a core set of values, uh, that we understand what it's like uh, to be oppressed. We understand what it means to fight for equality and for justice. And we understand that ultimately peace only comes when you resolve your differences with the people that you have been fighting with. And that's those are the core values of J Street. And that's the core values we will continue to insist upon as the core of what it means to be a Jewish American who cares about the state of Israel. So I think I'm just going to end on that note because uh, I, I, I very much appreciate it and am inspired by it. Um, especially, you know, being a dual citizen sitting here and, you know, very much caring about the reality um, in Israel, both, of course, the impact inside the Green Line and, of course, um, for my Palestinian friends and partners um, in, uh, in the West Bank and uh, in the Palestinian territory. So thank you um, to all of our viewers for all of your questions and engagement to you jeremy for your leadership for your leadership with the the most recent uh delegation um on those 15 members of congress and uh we are looking forward uh, to future opportunities to continue this conversation with all of you and uh have a wonderful afternoon and thank you adina because you are in charge of the Len hill education program and you're the one who puts together these incredible trips so thank you very much Thank you. Bye-bye.